Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Eric. I'm with Timescale. And at Timescale, we're developing a new time series database called TimescaleDB. It's based on Postgres. So I'm going to give you sort of a short introduction to uh, TimescaleDB and why we think it's a good idea to base things on Postgres. So there are lots of reasons. Uh, first off, it's reliable. It has a sort of a long history of usage. Uh, people depend on it for their uh, valuable data. Uh, it's easy to use, it's familiar, it's a SQL that many people know. Uh, there's a broad ecosystem of tools and utilities, connectors, etc. You can do things like backups, uh, uh, you can do high availability, rep replication, and things like that. It has flexible data types, so you can actually define your own data types as well. And there's a well-known add-on called PostGIS, which adds geospatial support, which is also really useful in time series settings. And uh, quite importantly, I think, you have the power of joining data together. And this is something I actually want to talk a little bit more about. So let's look at some data. So here you have kind of the canonical view of time series data. You have some uh, data stream coming in, basically timestamp values, in this case, temperatures. So imagine, for example, uh, you have uh, containers being shipped around the world with different cargo, and they might have sensors in them, with temp taking temperature readings, maybe humidity, some accelerometer, things like that, to make ensure that that cargo is uh, properly stored and uh, uh, handled correctly. So you, if you have data coming in from various sources, you might have some metadata as well. Uh, for example, a container ID that identifies the particular container, uh, and maybe some metadata about the cargo within, and then some other metadata for sure. Uh, so what you end up with here is uh, a very typical uh, data model that we see in many systems. Like if you look at Prometheus, for example, this is pretty much the exact model. Uh, Influx is doing something similar. Uh, but what we find, however, is that when we talk to customers, uh, data looks something more like this. And we have customers that have like 100 columns of data. And the reason why this is uh, the typical case is that if you have event data, for example, there's actually some value to keeping this data joined together. So if you have a temperature sensor, you have a humidity or accelerometer, this is all part of the same event, so it should be kept together. Uh, and further, taking this example to the next step, maybe you can actually store part of that metadata separate from the data stream in your data center. That makes it much more convenient to update the metadata. Maybe you, as the container is moving from port to port, you're actually changing uh, what type of cargo is within the container, but the container itself is the same. Uh, so this is what we see a lot when we're talking to customers. And this might actually be customers that have uh, this type of data <coughs> from before. Uh, they just kind of scale this to the point where the, the regular database can't handle the load anymore. So what we kind of uh, see uh, many people doing is that to handle these increased loads, they kind of install another database. Uh, so you get this kind of uh, setup where you have data silos. You have some type of data, time series data, going into a, a specific database for, that handles that type of data. And you have your relational data <clears throat> in another database. And the problem here is that then you have to join this information together in the application layer, which is kind of uh, much more difficult to do than do having everything in the same database. So that's what TimescaleDB uh, gives you, a way to keep the data in the same database using familiar interfaces. So now you can have both your time series data and your metadata or relational data, whatever business data, in the same database. So what are the high-level differences from plain Postgres? Well, what we've done in TimescaleDB is ensure that you, have, you always see high insert performance. And we get this performance from doing partitioning underneath the hood. And that's kind of automatic. It's taken care of for you, so it's very simple to use. You get easier management. 
We have added functions in the database for time-based analysis to make it convenient to query data. Uh, we've also optimized the planner to uh, account for the kind of time-oriented data in the data source. So we're kind of making sure that we're using the right indexes for uh, time columns, etc. You also see much faster deletes in the way we deal with data in the system when you're deleting. If you compare to other uh, databases like NoSQL, which is pretty common nowadays to store time series data, uh, with TimescaleDB you get secondary indexes, which is typically not supported in these systems. You get full transaction support, ACID, everything. Uh, you typically see lower memory requirements because you can have actual on-disk indexes. So you avoid these high cardinality problems we've seen in other systems. You also avoid these data silos that I described, and you can join data together, which I think is a really powerful thing. And you have full SQL support. This is a language that has been around for a long time. It's been proven over time. It's been extended. It's uh, very powerful. So TimescaleDB is open source. Uh, it's developed under the Apache 2 license. So if you're interested in learning more about uh, the development, you can go to our GitHub page, give us some stars. Uh, and I'm actually going to talk more about TimescaleDB uh, in the context of Grafana and Prometheus and how we can use TimescaleDB for basically your, all your metric needs for storing, analyzing, and visualizing metrics. So that's coming up in, a, in another talk uh, later this morning. So that's everything I had to say for now. I don't know if we're supposed to take questions or... Uh, just a quick one. One sure. of the challenges that we had with Postgres and time series data is that when you want to add or remove fields, um, messing with the schema becomes complicated. How, how do you deal with that in terms of schema? Yeah, we actually spend a lot of time making sure that we give the kind of impression of having a regular table. So ensuring that all of these kind of alter table commands and schema changes uh, work smoothly is something we spend a lot of time on. And I can tell you that, uh, you know, in, in most cases, you can just expect to do uh, these commands on a, what we call a hyper table in our uh, database. Uh, you can do them as you would expect them to work in a regular Postgres instance. 